this is World View and thank you for joining us. Now the votes have been counted in Israel's national elections and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party took the lead by a wide margin far more than anyone expected. With 90% of votes counted, the Likud has over 23% of the vote and 30 seats in the next Knesset compared to 24 seats and around 18% for Isaac Herzog's Zionist Union. Exit polls released at the conclusion of voting on Tuesday showed a very close race between the Likud and the Zionist Union with a coalition of Arab parties placing third. Now, Netanyahu and Herzog both declared victory, with each other claiming that they had the support needed to form a governing coalition. Herzog reportedly began trying to build a coalition without Netanyahu, despite potentially finished behind him. In an initial speech uh, to his supporters, Herzog did not concede and appealed to the other parties to form a socio-economic reconciliation government that would lead. A right-wing coalition now seems a certainty, with Likud going from 18 seats to 30 seats. The election results can be seen as a total deviation from figures posted in exit polls as weeks of public opinion survey showed the Zionist Union holding a slight lead over the Likud. As it turned out, Netanyahu and Likud were in a much stronger position than anyone expected. But the vote was not a complete loss for the Zionist Union. In the last election, in early 2013, the Labour Party, one of the parties that formed the Zionist Union, won about 15 seats and could not field a prime ministerial candidate. Now, a Labour-led bloc has won an additional nine seats and is well positioned to go into the formation of a government that will be accepted by all Israelis. Let's have a look at this report that shows us just how tense this race was. Just days before the election, Benjamin Netanyahu is on the ropes. The latest polls show the prime minister running behind a little-known mild-mannered politician. Now, the prospect of a major upset at the hands of Isaac Herzog, known as Bougie. There's fatigue. There's a lot of disappointment by Benj from Benjamin Netanyahu. I think his era is over. Focused more on his current job, Netanyahu has been slow to get on the campaign trail, but has been quick to blame, pointing to a, quote, worldwide effort to unseat him. Campaign officials say money from around the world, much of it from the U.S., is funding a grassroots get-out-the-vote drive called V15 with one goal, get rid of Bibi. After six years, Netanyahu's relentless focus on security seems to be falling flat among many Israelis who want a leader to not only keep them safe, but deal with rising food and housing prices, health care and welfare reform. In the increasing inequalities within the Israeli economy, the, the emergence and the widening of the gulfs between the haves and the have-nots, there he's vulnerable in these elections. Tens of thousands of people filled Rabian Square in Tel Aviv this weekend to drive home that message at an anti-Netanyahu rally. In his final push before Election Day, the Prime Minister has doubled down on his security platform. With a major speech to Congress on the threat Israel faces from Iran, now featured in a new campaign ad, <laughs> and hedging on his commitment to a peace deal with the Palestinians, leading to a two-state solution. Herzog says Netanyahu has an empty brand, warning about growing tensions with the U.S., Israel's closest ally under his leadership. I think that he failed, and I'm trying to call his bluff on this. Now, joining me in studio tonight is the Israeli ambassador to South Africa, Ambassador Arthur Link. Good evening, sir, and thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me, Yvonne. It's great to be here. It's such a pleasure. Now, we're talking about the just-ended Israeli elections. Now that it's done and dusted, there are a few questions that we would like to talk about. Perhaps the people also would like to know. Um, firstly, Ambassador, one part of the election that has received quite an enormous and um, a lot of attention internationally is that the number of women that were running in this year's election. Has that same attention also been given, particularly in Israel? Well, I think it has. It's interesting, uh, according to final figures, which came out earlier today, it seems that there are going to be 29 women out of the 120 members of parliament. That's a record for my country, and it's something to really be proud of. And uh, I think that, that uh, it shows 
is one aspect of the diversity and the things that we can learn from all of our community. Okay, so obviously this year it was just a, a completely turn out of events from gender inequalities to a whole lot of other political issues as well in this um, election. Now, how does religion, viewed as an aspect of culture, an influence the broader political culture and public policy? And of course, the reverse question, how can this you know, also affect the public policy and the culture. What role does religion really play in the political terrain of Israel? Well, Israel is a very diverse country with people of different faiths. I mean, Israel is the Holy Land. And so people of all faiths look to my country and look to, to places like Jerusalem and to Nazareth, mm -hmm. places that people grew up mm -hmm. hearing about in church or in synagogue or in mosque. But, it, but, it, but at the same time, Israel is a democracy. And all of our citizens, regardless of their religion or their background, or their gender, mm -hmm. or anything else, have equal rights. And as you, as you said earlier in your report, the fact that the third largest party in our parliament is an Arab party, mostly Muslim, many Christians as well, I think it shows the diversity and the, and the openness of Israel's democracy. But is that really supported politically in Israel? Uh, Obviously, yes, a diverse culture, like you clearly put it. But then the religion uh, aspect of it, their, their beliefs and all, is it really recognized in making political decisions within the Knesset? Well, it really is, in fact. Um, the chairman of Israel's election body mm -hmm. was a Christian Arab. We have judges, we have diplomats, we have members of parliament across the scale. Um, Israel is the only country in all of the Middle East where the Christian community is growing where there are more Christians today than there were 10 years ago. We know that in the other places in the Middle East, whether it's Iraq or Syria or Iran, Christians are running for their lives, literally. But in Israel, they're part of our community and, and part of our family. Okay, now, although the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is largely a conflict over land, we all know that it has been a conflict over land for centuries passed on, and uh, these land issues can somehow be resolved by international laws. But do religious groups also play an important part in those particular decisions? Well, I think that in the end it's a political discussion, and I, and I think it's not one about faith. Because I think that there's, that, that especially in a place like Jerusalem, that is so moving and so holy for Christians, for Jews, for Muslims, we have to find a way to share it with each other. And in fact, the holy sites in Jerusalem under the 47 years that, that Jerusalem has been united under Israeli rule, have been open. And there's a freedom of religion and a welcoming to people of all faiths. And we encourage and hope for our brothers and sisters from around the world to visit us in Jerusalem and to be moved and to be touched by the holiness of the holy city. Okay, Ambassador, with the talk of cold relations with the United States over Iran's nuclear program, how would you describe Israel's place on the international stage? Well, Israel obviously is one democracy in a crazy, complex, very difficult neighborhood. And we have lots of countries with shared values and interests around the world. One of them is the United States. There are many countries around Africa that have shared interests and values as Israel that understand the challenges of terrorism and violence across Africa, whether it's in Nigeria fighting, fighting Boko Haram or in Eastern Africa against Al-Shabaab. All of us are looking for a better life, for quiet, to be able to go to the shopping mall mm -hmm. safely and come home at night. And so I think that there's an understanding that Israel facing challenges of whether Hamas or Hezbollah or farther in the Middle East of ISIS, that it's a shared fight, it's a shared conflict, and that Israel and like-minded countries looking for security and safety and, uh, and freedom are on the same side. Okay, what kind of coalition is needed by Netanyahu and uh, the Likud party uh, in the formation of an incoming government? Will potential partners want to take part in that coalition with Prime Minister Netanyahu? Well, you're right to say that we're going to have to have a coalition, different than some countries that have a presidential system or have one party here in South Africa, the ruling party, the ANC, has 62% of the vote. Mm -hmm. In Israel, this is our 20th parliament in 68 years of, of independence. We've always had coalitions, and so we'll have one again. This one will probably even be a more conservative one, one that connects to traditional values, one that's focused on keeping Israelis safe in a, in a changing, moving neighborhood next to Syria, next to Hezbollah and Hamas. 
that Israelis, next to Iran, Israelis are concerned and want to be safe. And I think that that's one of the, the messages that Prime Minister Netanyahu sent in his campaign to keep Israelis feeling secure and allowing at the same time for our economy to develop and for people to have a better life. Does the nuclear reform program in, um, in Iran concern you at all? Well, it does. It concerns us a lot. And it doesn't only concern Israel. Every neighbor of Iran, whether it's the Gulf states or Saudi Arabia or other neighbors in our region, are very concerned about Iran. And we see them as an aggressive country, not the people of Iran. The people of Iran are people who deserve more rights and more freedoms, and we, they're not our enemy. But the people who lead Iran continue to call for the destruction of the state of Israel. The destruction, there's only, you know, there are 193 members of the United Nations. 193. Only one Jewish state. Only one. And there's only one example of a country calling for the destruction of another member of the UN. That's Iran calling for our destruction. That's not going to happen. We and other countries are going to stand up and be safe and live our lives. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, during the electioneering period, reinforced his stance on some security issues, obviously including one that we've just touched on, that is the Iran's nuclear program, especially when he addressed the United States Congress. The Zionist Union, on the other hand, campaigned on the domestic issues that are affecting people within the borders of Israel. Do you think the support Israelis gave to the Zionist Union in this election was a call for more attention to be paid to the domestic and economic issues within Israel? Well, 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 it's certainly true. I think that what you just said is right, that the campaign was run on these two different tracks, whether it was international affairs and security mm -hmm. or on domestic issues. In the end, I think one of the conclusions that we're going to find is that more Israelis were concerned about foreign affairs and were concerned about the, the violence that's going on in the Middle East. That if you just remember, just last year, in uh, the middle of 2014, thousands of rockets from Gaza came daily onto Israel. Mm -hmm. And there's 200,000 Syrians have been killed in a civil war and, and violence and, and chemical warfare or in recent times. And Iran continues to call for our destruction. That's a scary neighborhood, my friend. It's scary. And so I think that many Israelis said, we want to stay with a leader who makes us feel secure, makes us feel safe. But how are the domestic issues and economic issues in Israel at present? Well, we have a strong economy, but um, people want more. And, and I think young people were concerned about opportunities for housing and for social benefits and to be able to make sure that they can send their kids to university. Like in any modern Western country, have those economic concerns that balance out with foreign affairs. And uh, Israel is going to continue to move forward in its economy. We have a successful economy, very high-tech and innovation-based. But I think that we have to make sure that, that there's an opportunity for everybody. The United States expressed concern over Prime Minister Netanyahu's comments regarding the existence of a Palestinian state. Uh, the United States it will, says that it will re-evaluate its stance uh, on peace talks in the region after Netanyahu's remarks. What is your take on the concerns raised by United States? Already we can see a relationship that is somehow struggling between Israel and the United States, which is a top ally well, that's, of well, the that, country. Well, well, that, well, I think that that last point is the important point, is we're blessed. We have a warm, deep, structural, people-to-people -people connection between Americans and Israelis and between the Israeli government and the government of the United States. They're our closest friend. And we're by far their closest friend in the Middle East. We're the only democracy there. And now, does it mean that you agree on everything? I don't know. With my wife, we disagree on things sometimes too, every day. But uh, we have this deep relationship of values that brings us together and that we agree on much more than we disagree on. And we're going to find a way to move forward promoting the interests both of Israel and of the United States. And, and we're going to do it together because that's what we've always done. Okay, so irregardless that the United States says that it will change its stance, you don't see this affecting anything at all in the near future, in the long run, nothing? I think that, 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 that friendly countries disagree on certain issues. But I think that in the, in, in, the ma in the larger picture, Israel and the United States have shared values. We're both democracies. We're both free societies. We're both looking for ways to live with our neighbors in peace and security. We may disagree about this or on that, but for the 67 plus years of Israel's existence, 
America, the United States has been our closest ally and it will continue to be, I'm sure. Is there a chance that at any point the United States might have supported the Zionist party over the Likud? Well, the United States is a different country. Israelis voted in the end and have voted in record, record numbers over the last 15 years. 72 or 73 percent of Israelis of all faiths, Jews, Muslims, Christians, came out to vote in big numbers and came out with a conclusion and that's how democracy works and uh, South Africans get a chance to vote in their country soon in Nigeria. Nigerians will vote in their country and uh, Americans have their vote from time to time and uh, that's the way democracy works. Okay, Mr. Ambassador, most Republicans in the United States Congress are big supporters of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Do you see a continuation of the support? You have answered particularly the United States, but we're talking about the Republicans and the Democrats in well, this well, particular well, question. Well, one of the special things about our relationship between us and the United States is there's been something called bipartisan support, meaning that Israelis, no matter your political opinion, have an affinity and a connection with the United States. And Americans, whether they are Democrats or Republicans, feel a connection with Israel. And polling over the years has found that to be consistent. And I think that that's one of the strengths of our relationship, that it goes beyond politics. That it's not just one political party or another, or one leader or another, but it passes through the years because they're societies with shared values. Okay, now Ambassador Lenk, what is the Likud party and Prime Minister Netanyahu offering Israelis in the coming government? Well, again, the Prime Minister emphasized during the election campaign issues of security in an unstable region. He's certainly going to emphasize that. As you mentioned, in, the, in recent past, he's, re, he's, he's emphasized keeping Israelis safe from threats, whether they come from Gaza or they come from Iran. But at the same time, I think that there's going to have to be a concern and a focus on economic domestic issues as well, because the Israeli public, as a diverse democracy, expects that those, attention, those issues to get attention as well. The Prime Minister, in his victory speech, emphasized that issue too. And so I'm, I'm confident that that issue will come to fore in the coming month, weeks and months. Okay. Now, what, I don't know how I can really structure this question, but what kind of relations will come up between the Palestinians and the Israelis going forward? The Palestinians are calling for an independent state. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party does not support that at all. What kind of a relationship are we most likely to see? Is there a relationship at all? What does the future yeah, hold? Well, well, we have to find, we're neighbors. We're neighbors. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious that we have to find a way to live side by side in peace and security in this crazy neighborhood. We have to find a way to do that. And so I hope that the Palestinians will, will look at this new government, see it as an opportunity to restore talks, to restart a dialogue, to talk about mutual recognition, to find a way for Palestinians and Israelis to build a better life, to build a better future for both of us. Okay, right now we're going to take a short break as we continue with Worldview. Stay with us, please.